The Ulster Defence Association is a British paramilitary group based in the United Kingdom. They are the largest Ulster loyalist paramilitary and vigilante group in Northern Ireland. It was formed in September 1971 and undertook a campaign of almost 24 years during the Troubles. For most of this time, it was a legal organisation. Its declared goal was to defend Ulster Protestant loyalist areas and to combat Irish republicanism, particularly the Irish Republican Army. In the 1970s, uniformed UDA members openly patrolled these areas armed with batons and held large marches and rallies. Within the UDA was a group tasked with launching paramilitary attacks. It used the cover name Ulster Freedom Fighters so that the UDA would not be outlawed. The United Kingdom outlawed the UFF in November 1973, but the UDA itself was not prescribed as a terrorist group until August 1992. The UDA was responsible for at least 300 deaths. The vast majority of its victims were Irish Catholic civilians, killed at random, in what the group called retaliation for IRA actions or attacks on Protestants. High-profile attacks carried out by the group include the Milltown Massacre, the Sean Graham Bookmaker shooting, the Castle Rock killings and the Grace Isle Massacre. Most of its attacks were in Northern Ireland, but from 1972 onward it also carried out bombings in the Republic of Ireland. The UDA declared a ceasefire in 1994 and ended its campaign in 2007, but some of its members have continued to engage in violence. The other main loyalist paramilitary group during the conflict was the Ulster Volunteer Force. History Beginning the Ulster Defence Association emerged from a series of meetings during the summer of 1971 of loyalist, vigilante, groups called Defence Associations. The largest of these were the Shankill and Woodvale Defence Associations, with other groups based in East Belfast, the Hammer and Roden Street. The first meeting was chaired by Billy Hull, with Alan Moon as its vice chair. Moon was quickly replaced by Jim Anderson and had left the organization by the time of its formal launch in September. By this point, Charles Harding Smith had become the group's leader, with former British soldier Davy Fogel as his second in command who trained the new recruits in military tactics, the use of guns, and unarmed combat. Its most prominent early spokesperson was Tommy Heron, however Andy Tyree would emerge as leader soon after. Its original motto was Seed Enter Arma Toga and it was a legal organization until it was banned by the British government on 10 August 1992. At its peak of strength it held around 40,000 members, mostly part-time. During this period of legality, the UDA committed a large number of attacks using the name Ulster Freedom Fighters including the assassination of Social Democratic and Labour Party politician Paddy Wilson in 1973. The UDA was involved in the successful Ulster Workers' Council strike in 1974, which brought down the Sunningdale Agreement, an agreement which some unionists thought conceded too much to nationalist demands. The UDA enforced this general strike through widespread intimidation across Northern Ireland. The strike was led by VUPPU Assemblyman and UDA member, Glenn Barr. The UDA were often referred to as Wombles by their rivals, mainly the Ulster Volunteer Force. The name is derived from the furry fictional creatures the Wombles, and was given to the UDA because many of its members wore fur-trimmed parkas. Its headquarters is in Gorn Street, off the New Tonards Road in East Belfast, and its current motto is Quiz Separabit, which is Latin for, who will separate us, women's units. The UDA had several women's units, which acted independent of each other, although they occasionally helped man roadblocks. The women's units were typically involved in local community work and responsible for the assembly and delivery of food parcels to UDA prisoners. This was a source of pride for the UDA. The first women's unit was founded on the Shankill Road by Wendy Bucket Miller, whose sons Herbie and James Shamp Miller would later become prominent UDA members. 
The UDA Women's Department was headed by Jean Moore, who also came from the Shankill Road. She had also served as the president of the Women's Auxiliary of the Loyalist Association of Workers. Her brother Ingram, Jock Beckert, one of the UDA's founding members, had been killed in March 1972 by a rival UDA faction in an internal dispute. Moore was succeeded by Hester Dunn of East Belfast, who also ran the public relations and administration section at the UDA headquarters. Wendy Miller's Shankill Road Group was a particularly active women's unit, and another was based in Sandy Row, South Belfast, a traditional UDA stronghold. The latter was commanded by Elizabeth Lilly Douglas. Her teenage daughter, Elizabeth, was one of the members. The Sandy Row Women's UDA unit was disbanded after it carried out a vicious romper room punishment beating on 24 July 1974 which left 32-year-old Anne Ogilby dead. The day of the fatal beating Ogilby was abducted and forced upstairs to the first floor of a disused bakery in Sandy Row that had been converted into a UDA club. Two teenage girls, Henrietta Cowan and Christine Smith, acting under Elizabeth Douglas are orders to give Ogilby a good rompering, punched, kicked, then batted her to death with bricks and sticks. The autopsy later revealed that Ogilby had suffered 24 blows to the head and body. The killing, which was carried out within earshot of Ogilby's six-year-old daughter, caused widespread revulsion throughout Northern Ireland and was condemned by the UDA prisoners serving inside the Mays prison. None of the other UDA women's units had consented to or been aware of the fatal punishment beating until it was reported in the news. Douglas, Cowan, and Smith were convicted of the murder and sentenced to imprisonment at Armagh Women's Jail. Seven other members of the women's unit and a UDA man were also convicted for their part in the murder. The UDA, Romper Rooms, named after the children's television program, were places where victims were beaten and tortured prior to being killed. This was known as a rompering. The romper rooms were normally located in disused buildings, lock-up garages, warehouses, and rooms above pubs and drinking clubs. The use of the romper rooms was a more common practice among male members of the UDA than the female counterparts. Paramilitary campaign throughout the majority of its period of legality. The UDA's attacks were carried out under the name of Ulster Freedom Fighters. The UDA's campaign of violence began in 1972. In May of that year, the UDA's pressured leader Tommy Heron decided that responsibility for acts of violence committed by the UDA would be claimed by the UFF. Its first public statements came one month later. The UDA's official position during the Troubles was that if the Provisional Irish Republican Army called off its campaign of violence, then it would do the same. However, if the British government announced that it was withdrawn from Northern Ireland, then the UDA would act as the IRA in reverse, active throughout the Troubles. Its armed campaign gained prominence in the early 1990s through Johnny Adair's ruthless leadership of the Lower Shankill 2nd Battalion Company, which resulted in a greater degree of tactical independence for individual brigades. C. Company's hit squad, led by Stephen McKeague, became notorious for a campaign of random murders of Catholic civilians in the first half of the 1990s. They benefited, along with the Ulster Volunteer Force, and a group called Ulster Resistance, from a shipment of arms imported from Lebanon in 1988. The weapons landed included rocket launches, 200 rifles, 90 pistols and over 400 grenades. Although almost two-thirds of these weapons were later recovered by the Royal Ulster Constabulary, they enabled the UDA to launch an assassination campaign against their perceived enemies. North Belfast UDA Brigadier Davy Payne was arrested after his scout car had been stopped at a RUT checkpoint and large caches of the weaponry were discovered in the boots of his associates' cars. 
He was sentenced to 19 years in prison. In 1992 Brian Nelson, a prominent UDA member convicted of sectarian killings, revealed that he was also a British Army agent. This led to allegations that the British Army and IUC were helping the UDA to target Irish Republican activists. UDA members have since confirmed that they received intelligence files on Republicans from British Army and IUC intelligence sources. One of the most high-profile UDA attacks came in October 1993, when three masked men attacked a restaurant called The Rising Sun in the predominantly Catholic village of Greysteel, County Londonderry, where 200 people were celebrating Halloween. The two men entered an open fire. Eight people, including six Catholics and two Protestants were killed and 19 wounded in what became known as the Greysteel Massacre. The UFF claimed the attack was in retaliation to the IRA's Shankill Road bombing, which killed nine people seven days earlier. According to the Sutton Database of Deaths at the University of Ulster's Kane Project, the UDA was responsible for 259 killings during the Troubles. 208 of its victims were civilians, 12 were civilian political activists, 37 were other loyalist paramilitaries, 3 were members of the security forces and 11 were Republican paramilitaries. A number of these attacks were carried out with the assistance or complicity of the British Army, the RUC, or both, according to the Stevens Inquiry. Although the exact number of people killed as a result of collusion has not been revealed, the preferred modus operandi of the UDA was individual killings of civilian targets in nationalist areas, rather than large-scale bomb or mortar attacks. The UDA employed various code words whenever they claimed their attacks. These included the Crucible, Titanic, Ulster Trebles, and Captain Black. Post-ceasefire activities its ceasefire was welcomed by the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, Paul Murphy and the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, Hugh Order. Since the ceasefire, the UDA has been accused of taking vigilante action against alleged drug dealers, including tarring and feathering a man on the Tormona estate in South Belfast. It has also been involved in several feuds with the UVF, which led to many killings. The UDA has also been riddled by its own internecine warfare, with self-styled brigadiers and former figures of power and influence, such as Johnny Adair and Jim Gray, falling rapidly in and out of favor with the rest of the leadership. Gray and John Gregor amongst those to have been killed during the internal strife. On the 22nd of February 2003, the UDA announced a 12-month period of military inactivity. It said it would review its ceasefire every three months. The UPRG's Frankie Gallagher has since taken a leading role in ending the association between the UDA and drug dealing. Following an August 2005 Sunday World article that poked fun at the gambling losses of one of its leaders, the UDA banned the sale of the newspaper from shops in areas it controls. Shops that defy the ban have suffered arson attacks, and at least one news agent was threatened with death. The police service of Northern Ireland began accompanying the paper's delivery vans. The UDA was also considered to have played an instrumental role in loyalist riots in Belfast in September 2005. On 13 November 2005 the UDA announced that it would consider its future. In the wake of the standing down of the provisional IRA and Loyalist Volunteer Force, in February 2006, the Independent Monitoring Commission reported UDA involvement in organized crime, drug trafficking, counterfeiting, extortion, money laundering and robbery. On 20 June 2006, the UDA expelled Andre Shokri and his brother Ifhab, two of its senior members who were heavily involved in organized crime. Some saw this as a sign that the UDA was slowly coming away from crime. The move did see the Southeast Antrim Brigade of the UDA, which had been at loggerheads with the leadership for some time. 
support show Cree and Breakaway under former UPRG spokesman Tommy Kirkham. Other senior members met with Tishik Bertie Ahern for talks on 13 July in the same year. On the 11th of November 2007 the UDA announced that the Ulster Freedom Fighters would be stood down from midnight of the same day, with its weapons being put beyond use, although it stressed that these would not be decommissioned. Although the group expressed a willingness to move from criminal activity to community development, the IMC said its saw little evidence of this move because of the views of its members and the lack of coherence in the group's leadership as a result of its decentralized structure. While the report indicated the leadership intends to move towards its stated goals, factionalism hindered this change and was the strongest hindrance to progress. Although most loyalist actions were curtailed since the IMC's previous report, most of loyalist paramilitary activity was coming from the UDA. The IMC report concluded that the leadership's willingness to change has resulted in community tension and the group would continue to be monitored. Although, the mainstream UDA still has some way to go. Furthermore, the IMC warned the group to recognize that the organization's time as a paramilitary group has passed and that decommissioning is inevitable. Decommissioning was said to be the biggest outstanding issue for loyalist leaders. Although not the only one, on 6 January 2010, the UDA announced that it had put its weapons verifiably beyond use. The decommissioning was completed five weeks before a government amnesty deadline beyond which any weapons found could have been used as evidence for a prosecution. The decommissioning was confirmed by Canadian General John de Chastelain, chairman of the Independent International Commission on Decommissioning, as well as Lord Deems, former Archbishop of Armagh and Sir George Quigley, former top civil servant. Chastelain stated that the decommissioning included arms, ammunition, explosives and explosive devices and the UDA stated that the arms constitute the totality of those under their control. Following the decommissioning the Ulster Political Research Group, the UDA's political representatives, stated that the Ulster Defence Association was formed to defend our communities. We state quite clearly and categorically that this responsibility now rests with the government and its institutions where legitimacy resides. UDA representative Frankie Gallagher also stated that the group now regretted being responsible for the killing of more than 400 people. Sean Woodward, the British Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, stated that this is a major act of leadership by the UDA and further comprehensive evidence of the success of politics over violence in Northern Ireland and the act was also welcomed by Sinn Féin and DUP politicians. The President of the Republic of Ireland, Mary McAleese, described the decommissioning as a very positive milestone on the journey of peace. U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton also welcomed the move as a step towards lasting peace in Northern Ireland. Southeast Antrim Breakaway Group The Breakaway Faction continues to use the UDA title in its name, although it too expressed willingness to move towards community development, although serious crime is not prevalent among its members. Some who were arrested for drug peddling and extortion were exiled by the brigade. A clear distinction between the factions was not available in the 20th IMC report, as this was the first report to differentiate between the two politics. In the 1970s the group favoured Northern Ireland independence, but they have retreated from this position. The new Ulster Political Research Group was initially the political wing of the UDA, founded in 1978, which then evolved into the Ulster Loyalist Democratic Party in 1981 under the leadership of John McMichael, a prominent UDA member killed by the IRA in 1987, amid suspicion that he was set up to be killed by some of his UDA colleagues. In 1987, the UDA's deputy commander John McMichael promoted a document entitled Common Sense, which promoted a consensual end to the conflict in Northern Ireland while maintaining the Union. 
The document advocated a power-sharing assembly involving both nationalists and unionists, an agreed constitution and new Bill of Rights. It is not clear, however, whether this program was adopted by the UDA as their official policy. However the killing of McMichael that same year and the subsequent removal of Tyree from the leadership and his replacement with an inner council saw the UDA concentrate on stockpiling weapons rather than political ideas. In 1989, the ULDP changed its name to the Ulster Democratic Party. It finally dissolved itself in 2001 following very limited electoral success and internal difficulties. Gary McMichael, son of John McMichael, was the last leader of the UDP, which supported the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. The Ulster Political Research Group was subsequently formed to give political analysis to the UDA and act as community workers in loyalist areas. It is currently represented on the Belfast City Council. In early January 1994, the UDA released a document calling for ethnic cleansing and repartition, with the goal of making Northern Ireland wholly Protestant. The plan was to be implemented should the British Army withdraw from Northern Ireland. Areas in the South and West with strong Catholic nationalist majorities would be handed over to the Republic, and those Catholics left stranded in the Protestant state would be expelled, nullified, or interned. The story was printed in the Sunday Independent newspaper on 16 January. The Doomsday Plan was based on the work of Dr. Liam Kennedy, a lecturer at Queen's University Belfast who in 1986 had published a book called Two Ulsters, a case for repartition although it did not call for ethnic cleansing. The UDP's Raymond Smallwood said, I wasn't consulted but the scenario set out is a perfectly plausible one. The DUP's Sami Wilson stated that the plan shows that some loyalist paramilitaries are looking ahead and contemplating what needs to be done to maintain our separate Ulster identity.